There's suffering in the world. There's one religion that says suffering is an illusion. Then there's another religion that claims to that, that claims to take the reality of suffering very seriously and says, no, this, this is truly, truly suffering. I look at my experience and I say, I think that's an authoritative word because it sure seems to me that, um, that this coheres with reality. Otherwise, how do you explain something like the Holocaust? How do you explain 9-11? How do you explain uh, tsunamis and, and hurricanes and, and that sort of thing? Is that just an illusion? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, Scripture explains, and, and here I'm talking about the Christian scriptures, it, it explains the fall. That tells me that, that, that just because I feel a certain way it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way that things ought to be. Okay? Um, there are times where, I'm, where my thoughts are falling and, and it reveals the darkness of my heart. Is that the way things are supposed to be? S scripture, ex the, the Christian scriptures explain the fallenness of humanity. And it, and it tells me that what is, is not necessarily what ought to be. I think that was mostly for you to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have time for one more question, and then I think we'll have some closing statements. Uh, the gentleman in the back. So, so the question was, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on this, um, unless it's just a matter of my interpretation. Um, uh, the, does God care about my motivations? And so I, I, I seek Jesus because uh, because I'm afraid of condemnation, or I might have some other motivation. Is that is that it? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, it, yes, I believe that motivations matter. I, I believe that they do. However, I, I think, um, say for example, in the book of Acts, there's the Philippian jailer uh, the, the, who uh, sees his whole world crumble around him. When the prison walls go down, he feels all the prisoners have escaped. Uh, Paul reassures him, no, we're all here. And, and he, he, I, I think at that moment, because because I think the, the, the Spirit of God is convicting him, he, he says, oh, must they do to be saved? I, 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 I think there's fear in that. Uh, he, he recognizes that he's wrong, and this is perhaps a prophet of God. He, he recognizes that he stands uh, condemned before God, ultimately. Um, and what, what must I do to be saved? Um, and so Paul tells him, I repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, his, his motivation, I believe, there was, was fear of condemnation. I think that's a good, that's a good motivation. If, if, if people pursue God because they recognize, uh, I, I'm, I'm wrong before God. I, I, I need reconciled. I, I can't do it myself. I, I need a savior. I, and it's a great motivation. Um, uh, am I capable of, 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 of seeing Christ in all of his excellencies and, um, and, and, then, and then choosing him because he's the most excellent of all things? Uh, perhaps. Is, is that more praiseworthy? I, I'm not sure. I, I just know uh, that, that when people come to Jesus, they find the one by whom and for whom they were created. Uh, it, I, I might not even be asking a question. Why don't you clear? <coughs> Is it, is it still a good motivation if it goes against my personal judgment? But, but if I have a motivation, what's that? So if it goes against my own ability to reason, uh, is it still a good motivation? I'm, I'm not sure that, there's, that, that, that we would be, be motivated by something that goes against our reason. I mean, is that possible? I'm not, I guess I'm, yeah, I, I'm struggling here, I'm sorry. Yeah. What's that? To, to a person, I, I guess. You might still act as a greater motivator than your, your own personal ability to reason. When you say that God would take the motives of fear over motives of reason. Well, I, 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 I think when it, 
comes to coming to Jesus, it's always going to be an in intermingling of all those things, and I don't necessarily know that one is greater than the other. I think uh, wanting to be reconciled to God, fear of condemnation, is a, is a fine motivator. I... Why don't we let Dr. Wilson sure. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think that the only motivation that's really a bad idea in terms of at least the traditions I know of is the motivation to prove yourself right over others. And I think that that self-righteousness is a real big trap and uh, a really bad idea as a motivator. So, uh, but all the other motivations, you know, come as who you are. So. In a few moments, the uh, speakers are going to offer their closing arguments, but I want to remind you of two things before. Uh, first, we're going to have our second debate again on the 15th of November. And second, and more importantly for today, we have a book table outside where you can uh, purchase the texts of either, or pre-order the texts of either of the authors, and they can sign those texts for you. This is a chance for you to see uh, a lot more of what the speakers uh, have been arguing, what they've been articulating. I think that it's an excellent opportunity. We don't usually have that. We've been very fortunate tonight, so I hope you will visit that book table. Uh, we're going to close uh, with, I'd say, no more than two or three minutes uh, closing arguments. Why don't we start with uh, Dr. Oakland, since uh, Dr. Miles started before. Two or three minutes. Are you good? Oh, sorry. Or, or, or thereabouts. Or thereabouts. Okay. Um, can you give me, like, a one more minute? Yeah. <laughs> Wave. Thanks. I don't know. I, time is not my forte either. It's like numbers. Um, okay. Closing remarks. Um, I think our world right now is so desperately in need of reconnection with the earth that we need the gifts of indigenous traditions, as many are recognizing. I think in our modern society, the need for mindfulness and meditation is clear, and we're running around connected to the internet, but we're disconnected from those present and from what is going on. And I think that the gift of incarnation is a blessing to the world. It's a, that's a special gift of Christianity. God reached into humanity in a world so in need of love. How can that be ignored? But what is the response of a mother who loves her many children? She doesn't choose one over the others, but she appreciates the gifts of each. The great mystic Julian of Norwich wisely imaged Jesus as a loving mother. I think that Jesus would not condemn the other traditions. I don't have that exclusivist view. Um, and I don't think, I, I would not be an exclusivist whatever tradition I practiced. Um, some of my other, one of my other traditions is inclusivist and the other one is pluralist. So I don't have any exclusivity in there. I think we're in desperate need of a new interfaith project too. I think our Earth's ecosystems are in trouble in many ways. And I think it's not just the climate system, which is most critical, but I think species extinction, deforestation, the pollution of our oceans, the land and the air cry out for our attention. And we're running out of drinkable water, most critically. There's a need for all the Earth's religious traditions to find a way to connect us to what is going on with our Earth and to work together on solutions. We need to share our insights on an equal basis so that we can move quickly. We don't have time to argue what, who's right and who's wrong. <coughs> the stance that makes the most sense in a community of equals is the acknowledgement that each one's experience, including their religious experience, is valid and is to be respected. We need this understanding in the world. So to the question, are there many paths to the divine? I would answer yes, there are many paths to the divine. I think to say yes is not only logical, I think it's key to bringing peace in the world torn by religious conflicts and sectarian violence. And I think it's key to addressing our ecological crises. But even this response, I think, needs to be open-ended. So I would say, yes, there are many paths. Perhaps they converge at the top of the mountain. Let's climb it and see.
Well, gosh, I, gosh, I feel like I'm a preacher and I need to, to stand up. Um, I've, I've sought to defend the position that there is one supreme God, the creator who is sovereign over all. He has revealed himself as triune. He's uniquely revealed himself in Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, second member of the Trinity. Humanity, due to its rebellion against God, stood condemned before God, utterly without hope. God, who is rich in mercy and love, has reached out to us in Jesus Christ through the death and resurrection of Christ, paving not just a way, but the only way for a relationship with Him. In short, there's one way to the Supreme Creator God, and that's through His Son, Jesus. I've grounded that in the particularity of God. I'm arguing that like all persons, God is one way and, and not all ways simultaneously. That, that like all persons, we can make correct assertions and incorrect assertions about God. It's, it's possible to be wrong about God. Two things get in the way of our relating to God. Our knowledge of God, our behavior towards God. But these are absolutely interrelated. How can I say I'm rightly relating to God when I'm denying aspects of Him or His plan that are essential to who He is? It's akin to me saying that I know someone named Chris well, and I rightly relate to Chris, but I don't know if Chris is a man or a woman. See the nonsense of that? I've argued that pluralism requires us to ignore the essential differences in all the religions of the world. To make the case that many paths lead to God forces us to deny the distinctiveness of every religion, not just Christianity. When we do that, we're forced to three alternatives, it seems to me. We have to admit that it is acceptable and legitimate to believe contradictory things about God at the most basic and essential level. Or, we have to admit that it's impossible to know anything about God with any certainty. Where does that leave us? Three, we have to then become the arbiter of which claims are true and which claims are false. And, and typically how that's done in pluralistic fashion is to shave off the parts that we don't like, don't suit our preferences. This leads to us standing over God, creating Him in our image, according to our preferences, our sensibilities. And not one of these options strikes me as legitimate for sentient, rational people. So I'd implore you, to not be so intellectually lazy or dishonest as to reduce all the religions down to a lowest common denominator. Trimming away all truth claims that differentiate them one from another, and then in the epitome of begging the question, announce then that all religions are ultimately the same. If you came here being convinced that many paths lead to God, I'd implore you to take seriously the claims of each religion, starting where each one starts, recognizing that each makes fundamentally different claims about the nature of God, the nature of humanity, the nature of the world we inhabit. And then, I would implore you to start with Jesus. And you think, of course you, th you think that. Well, I, I can make that request with a, with a straight face for these reasons. Okay? First off, Christianity is falsifiable. It can be tested by the resurrection. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then by all means, discard Christianity. The Apostle Paul said that. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then, then he's, of all people, most to be pitied. That's a hard and fast criterion. If you can demonstrate that the resurrection did not take place, then by all means, go on to something different. Christianity is actually falsifiable. I like that. Uh, Jesus is a universal religious figure. I, I think that is significant. If, if all the religions of the world have something good to say about Jesus, and almost all of them do, that seems like a good place to start. With Jesus. Start with him and his claims. So, so I would commend Jesus to you for, for that reason. And, and, and then I would say this also. I think, I think Christianity makes the most sense of the world. It tells us that knowledge is possible. God created us in His image. And, and, and we can know things. We can't know God exhaustively. But that doesn't mean that we can't know true things about Him if He reveals them to us. It accounts for evil and suffering. It takes them seriously. I mean, if, if we want to know what God thinks of suffering, I say look at the cross of Christ. Look at the cross of Christ. I also think the biblical conception of justice is really compelling. It's really, really compelling. Those are just three reasons why I would commend to you, start with Jesus in your quest to rightly relate to God. Consider His claims. I'm confident when you do, because it's been my experience. You will find in Jesus the one by whom and for whom you were created. He won't be ashamed to call you His brother as you rightly relate to your father, God. <coughs>